Uh, well, we're in Luke, Luke chapter 2 today. Uh, we're going to kind of skip a, skip a week here in our study in 1 Corinthians and uh, look at a message entitled Parenting the, uh, the Son of God. Talk about uh, child uh, uh, training and raising in a day when it's uh, very, uh, very difficult to, uh, to do that. Uh, it, uh, uh, my introduction here will reflect a little bit of what's going on politically here in terms of the uh, uh, presidential race. Uh, it's been uh, interesting to watch the uh, kind of extremes in, uh, in both parties, but uh, uh, it's been kind of uh, uh, particular to watch the whole phenomena of uh, Bernie Sanders running as a, an avowed socialist uh, who had to join the Democratic Party uh, in order to uh, run as a candidate and then watch his success. It's also been interesting to watch interviews on TV. He draws lots of college kids and so forth. And when they're, when they're asked what socialism is, they have no idea. They, they think it means you're concerned about social programs or something. It's, it's bizarre, the answers. Now, they're, they're indoctrinated, it, uh, and that's kind of our, our first point here. They're indoctrinated from an educational standpoint all the way through. So very easy for them to except uh, the concepts and so forth. So it's been interesting uh, watching. Uh, a lot of this educational socialism uh, really sprang into being in 1977, what was, uh, what was called the, um, the Year of the Child, uh, developed by the UN. The UN uh, develops a, a protocol that they would like to see uh, in the educational systems around the world. And one of the things that was interesting about it when it first came out and what this is, it, it gives children's rights, children's rights become preeminent to that of their parents. Uh, and uh, you could see how that would lead to a little discord in, in, the, in the home. Uh, but that's the idea. But one of the things that came out about it was, and I'll just read a quote uh, written at that time by the chairwoman uh, who was from Czechoslovakia at the time. She said, long before... The representatives of all the peoples of the world and the UN decided to adopt the Declaration of the Rights of the Child and its Ten Principles. The socialist countries, that's just another word for communists, the socialist countries had gained vast experience in applying the ideas contained in the Declaration in everyday life. In other words, they're, they're taking uh, an educational system rooted and grounded in the communist or the socialistic countries, uh, and they encapsulate those as the UN, make it the year of the child, and talk about how, the, how great this is going to be for children uh, around, the, around the world. Uh, it very much then uh, implemented uh, in the current administration uh, over the last seven years in our, in our school systems. One of their big high priorities is, is uh, indoctrination of, uh, of the kids. Now, I want to read a, a portion of a letter now from somebody that's been very alarmed about this because they came out of one of those socialistic or communistic uh, countries, uh, in this case also uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, and this person writing uh, says the following, and, and it's uh, certainly a uh, relevant to where we're at this morning in our own culture. Uh, he writes, in Czechoslovakia, the great majority of women work, and the children are at kindergarten since several months of age. The impact of the family ties is horrible. My wife and I know from our own experience, the godless doctrine pumped into our little children's souls brought up the most cynical generation you could imagine. Most young people do not believe in anything, not even God. My wife recently visited our native country and returned with sadness in her heart. The godless system destroyed the great part of the will of the people and produced an obeying array of cynical, indifferent, disposable robots. What scares me most is the same process of liberation movement and jargon I heard 25, 30 years ago is happening right now in this country. And we have to go through it a second time. We must tell you that this collapsing morality and growing indifference are some of the reasons we received Jesus Christ several months ago as our Savior. Even though our background of dialectical materialism, another name for communism, is enormous and unmanageable, unimaginable to the average American. And again, so it's a challenge to be a parent. That's our whole point here. And one of the great challenges is the educational system that the kids uh, go through. It's, uh, uh, if they can get an education out of it, God bless them, but it's a tremendous uh, indoctrination system. The idea is that we'll teach them to be amoral, 
that is no morals uh, at all. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, it's gotten uh, uh, much worse from a Christian perspective uh, in the, uh, the last seven years. Uh, the second thing uh, that's a challenge is uh, not just the educational system itself, uh, but just uh, our own culture. Uh, we live in a culture where uh, people really don't train their, their children uh, uh, a lot anymore before they even send them to school. And um, uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, uh, psychologist, Dr. John, is it Rosen? Rosen? Ro- Rosamund? There you go. Anyway, sorry, I've read, read several of his books, just don't have his name written down. But he's, uh, he's uh, uh, written and talked about this uh, extensively, this idea and doing surveys about uh, uh, why it's required for smaller classes, so many teachers, teachers' assistants, and so forth, is because kids really come to school uh, and they've never been trained. Uh, when I was a kid, for example, and the, uh, the earth was still cooling, but it was a long time ago, uh, the, uh, there was about 30 kids uh, in my first grade class, one teacher. Nobody knew what a teacher's assistant was back there because kids showed up because all kids up until the 1960s, all cultures everywhere around the world were trained the same way. They were trained to obey and respect everyone in authority. <laughs> that means every adult in, uh, in authority. Uh, and so therefore, when they showed up at school, the school teacher's primary responsibility was to, get this, teach them. <laughs> that was all that was required, and it, it didn't take a lot of adult supervision. Uh, that's very changed. Uh, uh, a book that came out a number of years ago called uh, The Buying and Selling of Teenagers by Alyssa Quartz uh, writes that those under 25 are now the fastest growing group filing for bankruptcy, uh, and there's, uh, there's a reason for that. She said that uh, financial services companies now create teenage-oriented credit cards, cash cards. There's even a debit uh, for kid cards uh, so they can advance to their parents' uh, account. Uh, And that's led to uh, teenagers spend annually in excess of $100 billion a year. uh, And their parents spend an additional $50 billion a year uh, on them. And those statistics are about 10 10 years old. Uh, And the reason that they do that is to try to get their kids to obey them because they've never been trained by them. So tremendous challenges because of the educational system that's out there, uh, because of the culture that we live in. Uh, And uh, it's a bit of an oddity now when somebody actually uh, trains their children to obey them and respect uh, authority. But yet that's what the Bible teaches us uh, to do. Now, we're going to look at uh, uh, three, three points here from this uh, passage that uh, Luke uh, gives us, uh, again, in his uh, historical overview, uh, gives us no incidentals, just gives us the essentials, and we go from babyhood to childhood in the life of Jesus, childhood to adolescence here in just a couple of, uh, a couple of verses. And uh, we certainly say it was a great responsibility and a challenge to, to raise Jesus, on the other hand, don't you wish your kid was perfect and sinless? That, that would help. That would help just a little. But uh, uh, still, they, even though they uh, have that going for them, and, uh, and if you believe that your child is perfect and sinless, we have counselors waiting afterwards but, uh, to help you with that. Uh, but uh, it's not. And, it's, uh, and certainly, uh, there's still things that we can learn from uh, the parents of Jesus. Again, so we're in uh, Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 21 to 24. The parents of Jesus, we're saying, followed God's precise instructions. And certainly we need to do that uh, as parents if we're going to have the outcome we desire. Uh, When eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Uh, Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So uh, the parents of Jesus followed God's precise uh, instructions. Uh, They do it uh, in uh, in three ways. And uh, and again, the way way that uh, they... Uh, do this or what those instructions are, uh, I think is kind of in a sense at least 
at least in the timing and the ideas uh, is encapsulated in, in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord our God is one. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strengths. These commandments that I've given you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Moses is saying, Everything that I'm telling you today in terms of God's Word, it needs to be incorporated into your own life uh, before it can be ever assimilated uh, and uh, lived out by example before the lives of your kids. Uh, and how do you do that? Well, it sounds like pretty much all the time. <laughs> when, you're, when you're at home, sitting around, when you're out, uh, out on the road, when you lie down, when you, when you get up. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to have devotions with your kids, have a time with them, a special time but uh, teaching them about the Lord, uh, living it out before them the things of God in a Christian worldview, as well as the issues of salvation or something that uh, parents are to be doing on a regular basis, apparently all the time. Uh, and uh, we'll see that uh, the parents of Jesus were able to do that. Notice there's three areas that they're given, we're saying precise instructions, uh, uh, again, noting that it's a continual process no, first, his parents followed the precise instruction given by the angel. Uh, his parents named him Jesus, Yeshua, or Yoshua, meaning God will bring salvation. Uh, they circumcise him on, uh, on the eighth day. Uh, this is something that uh, had really, in the first century, uh, in a sense, lost all meaning to Jewish people. It's just what they did. It's just what they did. Uh, but what it was supposed to mean is they believed in the Abrahamic covenant. God said one day he would bring the Messiah and he would be a blessing to the whole world. Uh, there's lots more to the Abrahamic covenant pertaining to the Jewish people. I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. Uh, but through you, the whole uh, nations of the earth would be blessed. And when Jewish parents were circumcising their male child, they were affirming their belief uh, in that very core principle to who they were uh, as, as believers. When we dedicate our, our children to the Lord. Uh, we're, we're basically affirming our, our own faith uh, in Jesus Christ and, and our salvation, the covenant relationship we have with Him. And it's our desire, we're saying, that our child has that same relationship uh, with, with the Lord. Secondly, his parents followed the precise instructions given by Moses. Again, they were required to present themselves at the temple. That dedication is uh, spoken about in, uh, in Leviticus uh, 12, verse 6 and 7. Uh, there's two things about this idea and this instruction and following it. There's an offering that's given, uh, and it's a burnt offering. It means it speaks of dedication. Lots of different kinds of offerings that Moses prescribed for the Jewish people, but the burnt offering is the one that maybe we should relate to the most because everything is put on the altar and everything is absolutely consumed. It's burnt. It's gone. Uh, there, is, uh, there is nothing left. It's unique in that sense. It's the offering, I believe, that Paul speaks about uh, in Romans 12, where he says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. There's a lot of things we can do uh, that we believe in our aspects of worship, but ultimately, if we fully give ourselves to God, that's a spiritual act of worship. Complete dedication, uh, a burnt offering. Uh, that's uh, certainly what's going on here with the parents of Jesus. The second aspect is the idea, well, that it's a sin offering as well. Jesus has no sin uh, in his life. He is sinless. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's a reminder to Joseph and Mary, as well as to us, that we all need a Savior to save us from our sins. Uh, and we have both of those things implied uh, in following the instructions of Moses. Thirdly, his parents follow the precise instruction for uh, redemption. Uh, and at the end, uh, part of the sacrifice, it's for the firstborn child. It's a memorial. They're trying to remember. Uh, there's lots of things uh, uh, written into the law of Moses so that Jewish people and the Jewish families would remember what God did for them in, uh, in bringing them out of Egypt and out of that slavery uh, and, there's, uh, and memorials are a good thing. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they remind us. Um, one of the, uh, uh, we, uh, Kathy and I were able to uh, 
be in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, and um, so lots, lots of memorials, uh, lots of reminders of, uh, of our country. Boy, and just, uh, it, uh, it, in, in some ways, it, uh, it breaks your heart when you realize, and you're, you're vividly seen there in these monuments, uh, the history of the country and the tremendous sacrifice that's been made by so many for so long. Uh, and it's, uh, it breaks your heart to see the direction the country's going in certainly makes you want to pray for it uh, more and more. Memorials can be a good thing, Uh, and this was a a, a memorial to remind them that God did, in fact, deliver them uh, out of of Egypt. Numbers 18.15 says, here's the law, uh, everything uh, that first opens the womb of all flesh, uh, which they bring to the Lord, where their man or beast shall be yours, Nevertheless, the firstborn of man you shall surely redeem. It's called redemption money. It means the parents are thankful uh, for their son. Uh, God's intention that every firstborn male uh, should uh, enter the priesthood is the idea. Uh, the Jewish people were to be a nation of priests uh, and, and take the message of God's love and his grace to the world because, uh, of course, they didn't. Uh, they rebelled against him. And because of the failure of the people, God condescends to choose the, tree, the tribe of uh, Levi or Levi to be that, uh, that tribe of priests. The parents of Jesus believe God's word. They follow his instructions. It was necessary even for Jesus to be redeemed in that way, a memorial reminding them of what God has done in the past. And in this, the children see uh, the, the, the faith of their parents. Uh, Josiah probably won't remember today. <laughs> uh, Natalie probably won't remember today. But uh, Vanessa might, uh, David might, uh, Elijah might. Uh, they're seeing their parents. Uh, I, I hear parents to say sometimes, well, I don't know if I want to bring my kids to church. They don't really want to come. I hate to force them to do anything. Well, you can choose to do that. But what you're saying to your children is, my faith is not that important to me. And therefore, I won't make it important to you either. Or you say, (laughs) you're under this roof, we're going to church on Sunday. Hey, and change that attitude, by the way, or there's going to be repercussions later. My faith is important to me. I'll do everything I can to see you. Now, again, you're not going to beat them over the head with a large King James Bible uh, to get them here. You want them to know the love and the grace of God. Uh, But if it's not important to you, it will never be important to them. Uh, This is all meant to be a memorial. Uh, It's a tremendous example as well. Uh, Again, if the basics of our faith are not lived out before our kids, uh, they will seldom be lived out by them. Proverbs 29, 15 says, uh, The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to uh, to his mother. Uh, We had the uh, opportunity on several occasions to hear Dr. Wilder Smith uh, before he went to be with the Lord, brilliant, brilliant uh, British uh, uh, scientist, and and uh, uh, did, did uh, several several studies. Uh, one I remember he uh, made reference to, uh, it, where in fact uh, uh, they followed the the lives of of kids that were raised in Christian homes versus ones that weren't, uh, and the the culmination of this uh, uh, lengthy study was basically. Uh, if you want to raise a criminal, just let a child raise himself. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Kids that raise themselves have one thing in common. Uh, they become cr- criminals. Uh, and that's what the proverb is saying right there. Uh, proverb twenty nine seventeen. correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. And uh, I'm just mentioning a couple of verses here and uh, saying in the context as these go uh, slap in the face of the current uh, thinking and culture uh, of the world around us. Uh, and so it takes a lot of courage uh, and a lot of faith uh, in the Bible to raise your kids uh, in a godly way in this culture. Uh, there's a great blessing, though, and there's encouragement when we follow God's precepts. Proverbs 23, 24, The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise child will delight in him. Let your father and your mother be glad, and let her who bore you rejoice. Again, so our values are under the microscope. They're under attack. Uh, Which way will parents choose in terms of raising and training their children? Uh, It's a challenge. 
And of course, uh, we, we could broaden this application out uh, if we're saying that we should obey God's word when it comes to child training. Certainly, all of us need to obey it uh, and live it out before the culture uh, that's before us. God's principles are, are there, some, some overreaching principles, uh, and there's some precise instructions or precepts uh, that we need to follow as well. That's what, G, that's what Joseph and Mary did. Secondly, the parents of Jesus were reassured by God's prophetic promises. Ours may not be prophetic, but we've got lots of promises, and uh, it is a challenge. And so uh, we do need that reassurance so often as, uh, as parents. That's in verse 25 to 40. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ or Messiah. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marvel at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, the child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign which would be spoken against, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phananuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that uh, instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So go back and look at Simeon and uh, and his promises, and again, we're saying that all parents need to be able to have that assurance from time to time of of God's uh, promises. There were several people or groups of people in Israel at that time in the first century looking, hoping for for the Messiah to come. And certainly there were those that were hoping for a great military that would, leader that would be raised up to throw off the yoke of the, uh, the Romans uh, upon them to, uh, to deliver them and so forth. Uh, some even believed he might have miraculous powers that would enable him to uh, attain that position. And there were men like Simeon. They were actually called the quiet in the land. That was their title, the quiet in the land. They waited patiently, quietly, in prayer and worshiped uh, for a time when God would bring his comfort to his people through through the Messiah. Uh, Waiting for the consolation of Israel uh, is a term that means the comfort of the Messiah, and it's taken from Isaiah 40. Uh, Isaiah writing there in chapter 40 uh, begins a beautiful chapter of saying, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God, and then goes on and talks about the Messiah coming. Uh, It appears again in chapter 60, again, both times of the comfort that the Messiah would bring. This is interesting. It kind of brings us back to our uh, issue here of being a parent uh, in Isaiah 66, verse 12 and 13, when God wants to try to help us understand what the Messiah would mean uh, and be to us. uh, He writes there through the prophet, uh, Behold, for thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river. And the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Uh, Then you shall feed. On her sides shall you be carried and be dandled on her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. And you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Pretty neat. When God wants to try to explain what is the comfort like that the Messiah will bring to his people, he says, the best way I can put this, it's like a mother with her little child on her knee. That's the kind of comfort that we saw demonstrated <laughs> earlier with Natalie. Was she more comfortable with me or with her mother as soon as she was back with mom? She was fine. She was comforted. Uh, and God says, that's what the Messiah, that's what Jesus will be like. That's what he will bring 
uh, to us uh, in our lives. And that's what Simeon is speaking about here, looking for the consolation of Israel, the comfort of the Messiah. He says in verse 29, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. The word depart means uh, uh, release as a, as a prisoner, to untie a ship or to take down a, a tent. Uh, and he's really talking about that God has uh, spared his life, kept him his life to keep the promise he made to him. Apparently God had promised to Simeon, you be faithful to me, you continue to be the quiet in the land, you keep praying for the Messiah will come, I'll keep you alive until you get to see him. And he says, wow, I'm ready to go now. Uh, God's been faithful, God's kept his promises. But notice he says five very important things uh, to Mary uh, and Joseph, but particularly to Mary in summing up, uh, summing up the, uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ. He says many will fall as a result of Jesus' coming. That is, uh, Jesus would be rejected as the Messiah. And certainly he was rejected on a national basis, though he was received by individuals. The falling and rising of many uh, in Israel is the term that he uses. Those that would believe, uh, those that Jesus would be a stumbling block to. Uh, the reference to rising is also a reference to uh, resurrection. Uh, some would place their faith in him as the Messiah and they would be resurrected. Uh, a sign would be spoken against as a result of Jesus' coming. That uh, term is a sign, means a miracle. Uh, Jesus certainly did thousands of miracles. John uh, built his whole gospel around the seven I am statements and the seven signs or miracles uh, that he chose to uh, talk about Jesus as the Messiah. But here's the idea uh, of uh, in these miracles, there would still be no neutral position. People will either be for Jesus or, or against him. And a mother's heart would be crushed as a result of Jesus coming. A sword will pierce your own soul too. So many would, uh, would suffer the term uh, sword here. Uh, in the Greek, there's uh, two words. There's the makaira, which is like the long dagger that the uh, Roman soldier carried. Uh, that's not the term here. It's the term for the broadsword. It's the big double-edged blade that was held with two hands, and it dealt a crushing blow. Uh, it's not the dagger that's going to pierce your heart. Uh, this will be a crushing blow. And certainly, uh, Mary experienced that uh, in watching the, the death of her son uh, on, a, on a Roman cross. The verb Simeon uses means uh, it's present tense. It's going to continue to pierce. Uh, this would be a horrific experience in the end for Mary. Uh, knowing raising Jesus, knowing he's going to be the Messiah, knowing he's going to be rejected, he'll cause the falling and the rising of many uh, in, uh, in Israel. It would be very difficult days ahead for Mary. Uh, but she had wonderful prophetic promises that she could look back on uh, and rely on and be comforted by. And then lastly, the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed as a result of Jesus' coming. And that's what Jesus does. He does reveal the heart of the man. The cross divides us. Uh, the cross exposes us. Uh, Simeon, again, reassured them of God's promises to Israel. Uh, there'd be times when they would uh, need that, those promises. There are times that we need them as well. Proverbs 22, 6, train a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Again, it's the training is the, is the key. Uh, some people think if I took my child to Sunday school one time, that means when he gets old, somehow he's going to become a Christian. That's not what that means. Uh, it's a training. How does the training uh, re uh, happen? Uh, when you're at home and when you're along the, walking along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. That's uh, the training being talked about. But a wonderful promise. Uh, one of many in Proverbs 22, 6. Uh, Anna reassures them, secondly, of God's presence and God's character. Uh, she's quite a gal. Uh, she gets uh, uh, women in that time, girls, got married typically at around 15. Uh, she uh, lives with her husband for seven years, uh, so she's a, a widow at the age of, of 22. Uh, in that translation in the English, it sounds like uh, she's uh, now 84 years old. But it's saying she's been a widow for 84 years. She's now 106. Uh, I can just tell you, there weren't a lot of people around that time that were 106 uh, years old. Uh, God supernaturally kept her alive uh, for this prophetic moment as well, I, I believe. Uh, the whole point is that in all of those years, Anna had not stopped serving God. 
Uh, she was uh, a woman that could have become very bitter. I mean, 15, you're married. At 22, you're a widow, and that's it the rest of your life. Uh, but her view of God did not allow her to become bitter. You can view God as a tyrant, and when difficult things come into your life, uh, you'll grow, grow resentful, hard, even rebellious. But if you see God as your loving Heavenly Father, then sorrow and difficulty will make you kinder, softer, and more sympathetic to other people uh, around you. And that's who uh, Anna was. Uh, many uh, women written about in the Bible, 43 references to women in the gospel. Uh, Anna is one of many, but uh, certainly uh, played a crucial role here in assuring Joseph and Mary of what lies ahead of them and why they should trust the promises of God. She was somebody that had done that for uh, 84 years. So the parents of Jesus, as well as us, should follow God's precepts and his principles. Uh, they also should be comforted by God's uh, promises. Uh, and the Proverbs are filled with encouragement to, uh, uh, to uh, assure us to train our children. Uh, Proverbs 2, 1, My son, if you receive my words uh, and treasure my commands within you, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And by the way, that is the goal of parenting. The goal of parenting is not just to get your kids to obey you. That's good, uh, but we don't want to raise just little Pharisees that keep the rules and, uh, and the regulations. We actually want them to have a relationship with God. Um, again, uh, if you receive my instructions, treasure my commands, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. That's, uh, that's the goal uh, of, uh, of parenting. Again, so what were the results? So again, we don't we don't have the day in, day out of Joseph and Mary uh, raising, uh, raising Jesus and so forth. Uh, and certainly uh, we see that it's a process. But let's look down to and see part of the outcome anyway here in verse 51, uh, where we're saying, thirdly, the parents of Jesus were blessed watching the process that leads to maturity. It is, it is a process. Verse 51, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth, the he there is Jesus, and was subject, he submitted himself to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God in men. So again, submission is the, the first goal, developing maturity uh, into a, uh, a child. Uh, Jesus said, uh, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. Uh, if you teach a child self-denial, uh, his ability to be a disciple of Jesus uh, will be will be much much easier uh, if they don't get it from you maybe they'll get it from a coach maybe they'll get it in the military but kids need to learn self-denial uh, how to say no uh, no to themselves there's a little wisdom from Susanna Wesley she was the uh, <coughs> mother of John and Charles Wesley along with 15 other kids 17 children she raised and she writes the following the parent who studies to subdue self-will in his child works together with God in the renewing and saving a soul. The parent who indulges it does the devil's work, makes religion impractical, salvation unattainable, and does all that in him lies to damn his child's soul and body forever. Pretty harsh words, but somebody that... Uh, been around the block a few times in terms of child training, uh, to sub subdue. We see that with Jesus. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subdued. He was subject to them. Even Jesus was subject to uh, his parents, uh, Joseph and Mary. He had accomplished that. It's part of the process. It leads to uh, maturity. Uh, secondly, and, uh, and we won't uh, uh, go there or read there, uh, is the whole incident in the temple that takes place in verse 41 to 50. Uh, and you remember the story, the narrative. Uh, they're there, uh, uh, again, for one of the three feasts. Uh, they come as a group and travel to, uh, in great numbers for safety as they travel from Galilee uh, down to the area of the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, they return as a group, and uh, the assumption that Jesus at age 12 was still uh, with somebody from their group, and then, of course, they discover <laughs> he's not with them, and they have to retrace their steps and, of course, find him. Uh, in the temple. Uh, we note that he was 12 years old uh, at that time. Uh, that means uh, uh, Luke is telling us he's no longer a child, uh, now he's a boy. Uh, he's about ready to be bar mitzvahed. Uh, he's about ready to become a son of the law. 
He's about ready to embark on his, uh, his uh, religious position within the community, in a sense, uh, as an adult. Uh, it's why he's able to go into the court of the men uh, and baffle the rabbis and uh, uh, the other teachers there with his uh, many, many questions. But when they find him, uh, the, the following is uh, recorded for us in verse 49, and he said to them, uh, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Now, again, this, this uh, addresses the issue of the maturity of Jesus at, at the age of 12. He uses a, a definite article here. It's my father's business. I had to be about. Uh, so even at the age of 12, uh, he, he understands uh, who God the Father is. Uh, he understands his relation to him. He understands the need to be in submission to him. Jesus would constantly be saying later in the Gospels, I have come not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Uh, and, uh, and that's maturity. This is maturity. Uh, when a child is able to be subject to his parents uh, and listen to them, and he's in submission and subject to God and has a relationship with him as well. Uh, it can happen at 12. It can happen later, it can happen uh, uh, earlier, but we see it uh, very profoundly here with the life uh, of Jesus. This tells us that Joseph and Mary did a good job. <laughs> Literally, he's saying, I must be in the things of the Father of me. So G Jesus understands. We, we don't know what he understood up until this time, uh, and uh, there's a new movie coming out, The, uh, the Young Messiah. It's about Jesus as a child. I, I just hope they don't get really weird with it. The Risen is a very good movie. Well, I haven't seen the, the, uh, this newest one that will come out here at, uh, at Easter time, but uh, uh, you get all the new age teachers that talk about Jesus uh, creating butterflies in his hands just to entertain the kids and so forth. They have uh, you know, all kinds of uh, tall tales, uh, but we know that the first miracle, the first, was done at the wedding of Canaan. Uh, as far as we know, Jesus was just raised like any other kid, but by the age of 12, uh, there's a maturity. I must be about the things of the Father uh, of, of me. And then the process uh, that leads uh, to a maturity uh, was a blessing. Verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God in men. And the word favor certainly can and perhaps should be translated grace. Uh, in grace, and uh, again, with is that familiar term to us in the Greek para, uh, uh, alongside. Uh, in grace alongside of God in men. Uh, again, the implication here is there's a, uh, there's a change in the relationship. Joseph and Mary, like you, raise your kids, uh, and there's a point in time where the relationship changes. In this case, uh, if your kid's perfect, maybe it happens at 12, maybe it happens a little later with some other kids, but something happens, all of a sudden, he's walking along with God in men together. Uh, there's a relationship there. Uh, you want to hold the hand of your child and protect your child and teach your child as long as you can and as long as it's sufficient time to do that. There's going to be a point in time, of course, when you have to let go of that child's hand and you hope that the other hand is in the hand of Jesus Christ is the idea. That they've grown and they've grown in a relationship with him uh, by the grace of God. Uh, and it says, and Jesus grew. Uh, he matured. Uh, he was like most normal boys, but he matured uh, in favor, uh, and that resulted with an understanding for him of what his life was to be all about. Uh, and our kids, uh, we want to try to embrace that or see them embrace that as well. Uh, what we live, uh, what, we're, what we do for a living uh, is not what life is all about. Uh, the kind of car we drive or the kind of house we live in is not what life is all about. It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus knew that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. And then we're, we're actually given the instructions to, to do the same. Again, so Luke takes us from babyhood to childhood, from childhood to, uh, to adolescence. Uh, precepts and principles to follow. Counter culture completely. <laughs> Uh, you're not Christian friends will think you're crazy. Uh, they will criticize you. Uh, they will say what you're doing is old-fashioned, doesn't work anymore. Uh, you have to embrace a new way, a new way of thinking, the new psychology, whatever the term might, uh, might be. Uh, it takes a lot of courage these days. Uh, it takes uh, encouragement. Again, we do 
uh, baby child dedications. Uh, uh, we could come here on a Saturday and do this a lot easier, but it's something we do together as a church because it, it, we're embracing and saying, and we're going to be praying for those parents because they need it. Uh, we're going to be praying for that child because they, they need it. As we mentioned last week, these are, these are dark days that we're, we're living in. We're way past, uh, we're way past uh, the idea of uh, living in a post-Christian nation. We have a tremendous heritage uh, here in the islands uh, in terms of Christianity. We have a tremendous heritage uh, in, uh, in terms of the country and our founding fathers. Uh, but uh, they are some of the most criticized people around today. Our founding fathers are some of the most criticized people around today within the public school system <clears throat> because they had our values and embrace our values. Uh, it's just different days that we're living in. Uh, it takes a lot more courage today than uh, ever before uh, to implement God's principles, uh, His precepts, and certainly we need His promises to assure us that we're on the right track, doing the right thing. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a tremendous blessing uh, in, uh, in the end. There's been a couple of surveys, uh, and we're going to have communion in a moment. Just, uh, uh, just a one, one last thing, uh, National Study for Youth and Religion. This has been uh, uh, borne out on several occasions, but uh, in, or, in order to see uh, your child, to see a young person receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and sa- Savior, uh, typically three things need, need to happen. Uh, the thing that I've just talked about in it, and again, the, the idea, if you go back to the, uh, the reference to uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, is that, you know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our, our God. He's personal to us. The Lord is one. We've, we've got a correct theological understanding of who God is. And we're to love him with all of our heart, uh, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Uh, and then uh, we're, we're to take that, what we have personally, uh, and impress it on our kids. Uh, you can't take somebody to a place you've never been yourself, spiritually. Uh, and uh, you might have a Google map to get you somewhere, but uh, it doesn't really work that way in the spiritual realm. You have to really uh, embrace it and live it out. Uh, if you do, then you've set the stage, stage one, for your child to walk with the Lord. Stage two is they apparently have to see it lived out in somebody else's life. That could be a Sunday school teacher, it could be an uncle, it could be an aunt, it could, you know, it could be a grandparent, uh, it could be a coach, uh, it could be you know, uh, somebody else. Somebody else that's older, this is according to, to several surveys, uh, and when a- asking kids, you know, why did you become a Christian and how did it come about? They saw it lived out by their parents, they saw it lived out through a mentor of some kind, uh, and thirdly, before the age of 17, they also had some personal experience with God where they experienced the grace of God. Now, we can, we can do uh, Sunday school. We can do uh, mission trips. We can do youth groups. We can do a lot of things. Uh, but those kids all have to personally embrace it for, for themselves. And uh, so I encourage you to continue to pray for all the kids, you know, the teenagers, all the kids that you see around. They, re- they really need your prayers. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and as Oskina said in uh, the uh, apologetics conference we went to a few weeks ago, uh, if, if those kids don't go out and reach their generation, uh, our world will never, never survive. It will never be, be the same. Uh, and so we have an obligation, certainly as parents, grandparents, uncles, and aunts, uh, to teach, to live out, uh, but also to, to pray for one another. Amen? All right. Well, uh, I'm going to pray, and uh, we're going to receive the communion elements, and I'll come back up. We'll take them together. Lord, we, uh, we do thank you that we have those. We have a training manual, Lord, for salvation uh, and for finances and for uh, raising our kids and so many other things. Uh, the promise of wisdom. We've got five books. They're all about wisdom. We call them the wisdom literature. And uh, Lord, we need, we need wisdom in the days that, uh, that we live in. We need courage to live out your word uh, before a fallen world that has uh, rejected you in a culture, for the most part, that has uh, rejected you. Lord, so we pray for just the the strength and the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives uh, to help us do these things. Uh, A lot of us are way past parenting, but uh, there's still kids around us, still kids that we can uh, influence and uh, model before. Uh, And I pray that uh, each of us would see uh, the role that we have to play 
uh, in the next generation uh, behind us. Lord, and what a critical time that they live in. So we certainly want to remember them and pray for them. Lord, as we take communion now, uh, again, a good time to remind ourselves of uh, your love for us, your grace for us. This is a memorial. We're reminding ourselves of the covenant relationship we have with you. And these elements remind us of the sign of that covenant, Lord, your body broken, your blood spilled for us. Lord, so as we worship you, as we hold the elements uh, in our hand, we pray that we would once again uh, recount and remember our salvation, what it is you've done for us. You would enlarge our view of your grace and your mercy shown to us through Jesus Christ. So let's do that now. Amen.